Hi everyone, it's Katrina. From ancient Ethiopian angels building churches to the death-defying sport of ancient people, here are some of the most mysterious early civilizations. The Aksumites 2,000 years ago, Ethiopia was home to a mighty kingdom, the likes of which it hasn't seen since. The civilization of Aksum was one of the first Christian empires in the world. In the 3rd century AD, they were declared one of the four great powers of the globe. Their only rivals were Persia, Rome, and China. Their lands spread from Africa into Arabia, and they conquered the kingdom of Kush in Nubia. The Aksumites dominated the Red Sea up until around the 7th century. The explosion of Persians and then Muslims in the Red Sea region led to their downfall. They no longer controlled the necessary trading routes, and after thousands of years, they suddenly became unimportant. The Aksum Kingdom fell into a dark age and completely collapsed by the year 960. What happened next is really interesting. The glory days were over, but Ethiopia wasn't done. They entered their own medieval age, growing isolated from the world. Ethiopia is an extremely difficult place to get to by foot. Its borders are protected by hundreds and hundreds of miles of desert and almost impassable mountains. Within the insulated region, a new civilization began to prosper. It was a predominantly Christian empire that thrived only inside the borders of Ethiopia. In the 12th century, the Zagwe dynasty ruled over Ethiopia. Under the kingship of King Lalibela, he built the city cut from rock with the same name. He had spent a lot of time in Jerusalem, which was enveloped by Christian ideas. So in the town that he built and named after himself, he commissioned 11 monolithic churches to be constructed. He was inspired by Jerusalem and wanted to recreate the holy city in the highlands of Ethiopia. These are the rock-hewn churches of Lalibela. They are still used to this day as places of worship and for baptisms. The structures are amazing, partially underground and boasting incredible craftsmanship. Each church was hewn from a single massive boulder. The local legend is that Lalibela didn't build the churches by himself. Instead, he was helped by angels from heaven who built the religious buildings in a single night. This is the same country that claims they have the Ark of the Covenant, so this place is full of ancient Christian history. I want to give a big shout out to Charles Laburier and Malachi Neal. Hope I said your names right. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, hit that subscribe button and join the family. Greek Eugenics The word eugenics brings to mind Hitler and his final solution. During World War II, millions of undesirables in the eyes of the Nazis were exterminated in concentration camps. It was part of Hitler's idea to create a genetically superior race of humans. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the eugenics movement can be traced back to the ancient Greek civilization. Some of the most notorious supporters of eugenics were the Spartan warriors of 2,500 years ago. Famous philosophers like Plato and Aristotle even debated the morality of eugenics. Plato was particularly interested in the subject, and he came up with a system called judicious mating. It was a way to ensure that only the most desirable traits would be passed down within Athenian families. Plato argued that men should procreate no older than 25, and women should be finished having babies by the age of 20. He also wanted to abolish marriage. Plato believed that only the smartest and most attractive noblemen should be allowed to reproduce. Only high society Athenian ladies, who were seen as particularly attractive, should be producing with the aforementioned males. Rather than getting married, Plato suggested that the most perfect Athenian specimens be brought together with poetry and dancing. Then they'd procreate and be forced into celibacy. And of course, Plato was a big believer in brother-sister unions to keep the bloodlines pure. Sure, the Greeks were advanced in art, democracy, and warfare, but the civilization was obsessed with the same idea of eugenics as Hitler. And now I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind. Aristotle, the beloved philosopher, came up with a plan for the elite members of Greek civilization to easily rule over the underclass. His idea was that while the Greek nobility was busy creating the perfect versions of themselves, poor people were allowed to breed as much as they wanted. His thought process was that if the lower classes had more children, producing what were seen as inferior kids who weren't quite as intelligent or good-looking, 
they would be easier to rule over. The Greeks were highly invested in the idea of eugenics, both to create flawless versions of themselves and to breed a less-than-intelligent peasant class that was easy to control. The Vanished Kogurio Civilization North Korea is undoubtedly a strange and isolated place in this modern world, but they still have a vast and expansive history just like everywhere else. One of the most recent discoveries out of North Korea involves the very mysterious Kogurio Civilization which disappeared without a trace almost 1,400 years ago. In 2021, archaeologists in North Korea found a group of ruins and some ancient artifacts connected to the Koguryo. This dynasty ruled parts of northern China and the top half of the Korean peninsula for almost 1,000 years. They were in control of North Korea between 277 BC and 668 AD. The discovery included nine tombs and buried stone chambers, as well as gold and silver relics. The tombs are fairly ordinary, consisting of a subterranean passage leading into a deep stone chamber. However, there was no sign of mummies or skeletons, so the tombs were likely raided previously during ancient times. It's cool to find this kind of thing because people don't even know about the Koguryo, despite them being so powerful. They were one of the longest ruling Asian dynasties in history. They were rivals of the Paekche and Silla kingdoms of Korea, each of whom fought for dominance over the peninsula. Historians think the Koguryo were likely crushed by the Silla army when they united with the Tang dynasty of China. In 668, the lands of Koguryo suddenly became a Chinese province. The really amazing part of this is that the Koguryo civilization was enormous. They controlled a massive amount of territory, whereas the Silla were tiny, controlling a meager scrap of land near the coast. If it hadn't been for the persistence of the Tang dynasty repeatedly attacking Koguryo, Korea itself could be a very different place today. Pocahontas and the Algonquian I'm sure you remember Pocahontas, but how much do you really know about Pocahontas and the Algonquian tribes of North America? Right now, you're going to get the whole story, every last brutal piece of it. The first thing you need to know is that Pocahontas was never her real name. The person Pocahontas was based on was a woman named Amonute, who was born in 1596. Pocahontas may have been her nickname, since it means playful one in the Algonquin language, but nobody is entirely sure. Either way, Amonute was the daughter of the great overlord of the Algonquin tribes, and he was called Pawatan. He wasn't a king in the traditional sense. Pawatan was the chief of over 30 tribes living in the area of Jamestown and Virginia. He was the closest thing to a king that the early English settlers encountered in the New World. The Algonquin themselves are extremely complicated. The remainder of these people now live in eastern Canada, with somewhere around 40,000 people identifying as being Algonquin. Most of them live in Quebec, but there are scattered pockets throughout the east. Various Algonquin-speaking people used to live all the way to the Tidewater region of Virginia. Powhatan didn't rule the Algonquin, but he led a huge alliance of differently named tribes that spoke the same language. His own tribe was the Pamunke. The fairy tale version of Pocahontas is that she saved the Englishman John Smith from being executed by her father. Then they fell in love, and their love helped find common ground between the two cultures. The real Pocahontas, Amonute, became known to the settlers, but not because she loved a man named John Smith. She'd bring them food and negotiate the release of Native American prisoners. In 1609, the English settlers were dying from disease and starvation, and they might have gone extinct if it hadn't been for Pawatan and Amonute's generosity in giving them food. Amonute married a man from her own tribe in 1610 named Kokoum. But three years later, she was kidnapped by the English and held against her will. The English wanted to trade her life for the life of their own prisoners, but Powhatan refused. Her own father didn't want to pay her ransom. During her time as prisoner, she was baptized and given the Christian name of Rebecca. And also while she was a prisoner, she met a man named John Rolfe and married him. They were wed in 1614, with the Union ushering in a brief season of peace. The newly named Rebecca then joined John and their new son Thomas on a journey to England. She was a princess there, gawked at by the masses in London as Lady Rebecca Wolfe. She was even introduced to the royal family. 
Pocahontas, as she's known today, was truly a remarkable figure from the Algonquin culture. The love story between her and John Smith might be dramatized, but her life really was spectacular and interesting. Sadly, she died in March 1617 on the way back to Virginia. She got sick soon after the boat set sail and was buried in England upon her death. Halua Sledding and the Ancient Hawaiians The ancient Hawaiians used to be into some serious sports. Forget about surfing the waves. People from the Hawaiian civilization used to surf volcanoes. All across the volcanic islands, you can find the remnants of Kaua Halua. These were kind of like ski slopes built on the sides of volcanoes hundreds of years ago. It took a significant amount of work to make these things. The Hawaiians painstakingly built long pathways of lava and gravel zigzagging down volcanoes. They were used as both playgrounds and proving grounds. The Hawaiians would fashion a wooden set of skis that measured about 12 feet long, and typically they ended up looking like thin ladders. Then, from the top of the volcano, they would use the giant set of wooden ladder-like skis to surf the slopes to the bottom. This sport is called hi holua, and the most epic of all the kahula holua is called the kaneaka. It was built in 1814 by King Kamehameha the Great on the slopes of the Hualalai volcano. He would have bombed down the track like a champion skier, thrashing down Everest. Just imagine putting a modern president into a pair of 12-foot-long skis and sending them barreling down a volcanic mountain. The ancient Hawaiians clearly had a much different breed of ruler than we do today. This sport has been practiced for at least 800 years. Hawaii was settled around 1,600 years ago by Polynesian sailors migrating from places like Tahiti and the Samoan Islands. They didn't really come into being as their own unique island empire until around 1219. This lasted until 1810 when Kamehameha the Great established the Kingdom of Hawaii. Nobody knows when the first ski slope on a snowless volcano was made, but this sport was definitely popular with the Hawaiian people, and some adrenaline junkies still practice it today. Would you like to ski down the side of a volcano? Let me know in the comments below! And while you're at it, subscribe to the channel! Ethelfled and the Anglo-Saxons Female rulers have been a staple of British society since ancient times. 1,100 years ago, long before Queen Elizabeth I or Queen Elizabeth II, there was Ethelfled. She was the daughter of Alfred the Great, the king of the West Saxons. Her mother was a royal Mercian woman named Elswith. Upon her birth in the early 870s AD, Ethelfled became an Anglo-Saxon princess. But who were the Anglo-Saxons anyway? Just about everybody has heard the name, but good luck getting someone to tell you the details of the Anglo-Saxon chronicles. In the 9th century AD, England wasn't a singular nation or even a singular empire. It was a fractured amalgamation of small kingdoms. There was Wessex, Mercia, and Northumbria ruling in the far north. They were all considered Anglo-Saxons, but they were hardly the same people. They all came from three distinct tribes in northern Germany and southern Scandinavia. There were the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, but there were likely many more whose names have been lost to history. When the Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century AD, the Picts of Scotland began a brutal assault on the declining Roman towns. The weakness of the borders allowed immigrants from mainland Europe to come over, and by the year 800 AD, the Germanic tribes had become the three main kingdoms I mentioned earlier. Then they were suddenly under siege by a new enemy. The Anglo-Saxons had come as invaders, defeating the Romans who had done the exact same thing to them 400 years earlier. But now, the Anglo-Saxons were being invaded by Vikings. By the time Ethelflaed was born, the Vikings had done serious damage. But with Ethelflaed ruling the Anglo-Saxons, things took a turn for the better. Ethelflaed completed several successful military campaigns that hugely expanded her territory. She took over the Welsh, the Vikings who were occupying the Midlands, and parts of Northumbria. She died in 918 AD as one of the most powerful female rulers in English history. Which ancient civilization lasted the longest? So, which civilization lasted the longest? Was it ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, or China? It might surprise you to know that by almost every metric, Chinese civilization is the longest-lasting in all of human history. 
But how do you measure the success of a civilization over millennia? There are a few distinct features that mark China as one continuous civilization throughout most of history. One of them is language. When you look at somewhere like ancient Egypt, they've gone through multiple writing systems. The Egyptians had hieroglyphics, Coptic script, Greek, and multiple others. Egypt was also ruled by foreign dynasties throughout a huge amount of their history. It started with the Hyksos in 1650 BC and continued with the Nubians, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Macedonians, and the Romans. No matter what you think of ancient Egypt, they weren't a single continuous culture. China, on the other hand, most likely was. They have been using the same form of writing for 3,200 years. The same characters are being written the same way today that they were 1,000 years before the Roman Empire even existed. This is something that's uniquely Chinese. Of course, though, there have been countless ethnic groups since the original Liangzhu culture on the Yangtze River 5,000 years ago. But to be honest, there are ethnic groups everywhere, even within the same civilization. There are technically 50 ethnic groups in the United States right now because people identify as being from a particular state. The Roman Empire was a single civilization made of cultures from around the Mediterranean and the Levant, but nobody would argue they weren't a civilization. China has had plenty of ethnic groups and a lot of different cultures, but they've managed to survive as a single enormous civilization for longer than any other. However, keep in mind that this subject is highly contested and not all historians agree. Which civilization would you say has lasted the longest? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Stone Circles of Senegal and Gambia There are four massive stone structures spread over thousands of miles throughout Senegal and Gambia in West Africa, which are called the Stone Circles or the Senegambian Stone Circles. Dating back to roughly 300 BC, the constructions are accompanied by evidence of ancient communities, including 17,000 monuments, 2,000 home sites, and numerous graves. Based on the amount of labor required to build these structures, these ancient communities once made up a very organized and prosperous society, according to Brand South Africa, a website dedicated to crafting a compelling and historically accurate image of Southern Africa and other parts of the continent. The four areas with these standing stones are a UNESCO World Heritage Site and are believed to have outstanding universal values, representing a traditional monumental megalithic construction. Experts believe the stone circles appear to be deliberately arranged, probably for religious or communal reasons. Sourcing the materials and building the monuments would have required specialized knowledge of the laterite stone they are made from, as well as advanced toolwork. It consists of 52 stone circles, as well as one double stone circle and 1,102 carved stones. It is here that archaeologists found layered evidence in the ground of roughly 700 years of community activity, as well as quarries and evidence of iron smelting. The goal is to protect these sites with government support and to make the sites visible and accessible to the public. Earliest Human Facial Piercing Early this year, scientists announced the discovery of the first known facial piercing in a human, which they found while examining a 12,000-year-old skeleton from Tanzania. The man's remains were originally discovered in 1913, but researchers didn't notice his facial piercings until far more recently. Archaeologists from the University of Coimbra in Portugal came to this realization by re-examining the deceased man's teeth, which at first had appeared to be deliberately filed down. It was this second look that helped them see that the individual's teeth were more likely worn down from objects scraping against them, meaning that his cheeks and lip were probably pierced. While it's unknown what his jewelry was made from, it was rather large, at least one inch wide. Body modification is popular today and has a lengthy past, but experts are unsure how far back the practice goes. The discovery of the millennia-old pierced skull is the earliest evidence they've found of it so far, but body modification could have gotten an even earlier start than that, because piercings typically only leave marks on soft tissue that deteriorates after someone passes away, like skin and muscle. So it's hard to say when people started adorning themselves in this way. Before this, recent studies set the date back to at least 12,000 years ago. The previous earliest evidence of piercings was from around 10,000 years ago and was found at archaeological sites in modern-day Sudan. Great Zimbabwe Stone Houses the Great Zimbabwe Stone Houses are a collection of three stone compounds that make up the ancient city of Great Zimbabwe. 
Perhaps the most perplexing aspect of them is the fact that they were constructed using advanced masonry and building methods that were not found in any of the surrounding areas at the time of construction, starting around 900 years ago. More particularly, these structures were made without the use of mortar. Great Zimbabwe flourished between the 10th and 15th centuries, and its stone structures contained equally impressive enclosures, with walls as tall as 36 feet. It took around 300 years to build the city, which contained around 18,000 residents at its peak. The first known written records of Great Zimbabwe date back to sometime during the 16th century, long after the city was abandoned. While it's unknown why residents fled, experts speculate that the depletion of nearby gold mines may have triggered the exodus. But researchers are admittedly still learning about Great Zimbabwe, as much of the site remains unexcavated. In fact, in 2016, a team of scientists estimated that only around 2% of the 1,780-acre city has been unearthed. Evidence thus far indicates that people inhabited different parts of the city at different times, and that the sophisticated society was a monarchy with its own religion. Moreover, the purpose or purposes of the great stone buildings are a source of debate among archaeologists. Regardless of the unknown, the impressive city is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a national symbol for the country of Zimbabwe. Lalibela Churches As Christianity became increasingly popular throughout parts of Africa during the 12th century, more churches were needed to accommodate the burgeoning number of worshippers. A complex containing 11 such structures, known as the Lalibela Churches, were carved out of rock in the mountains of Ethiopia during this time of growth which was also during the Zagwe dynasty. The churches are situated in two main groups and are connected by a complex system of trenches, drainage ditches, and ceremonial passages, some of which lead to mysterious hermit caves and catacombs. While most of the churches were probably used as such from their construction onward, two of the buildings may have served as royal residences, according to UNESCO. One of the churches, Biete Midhani Alem, is believed to be the world's largest monolithic church. Beyond their use for traditional worship, these monolithic cave churches also served as a pilgrimage destination for early African Christians who were unable to travel to Jerusalem. It is here, in this complex that was designed to resemble parts of Jerusalem, earning it the reputation of a so-called New Jerusalem, that the devout pay their homage to King Solomon. The Lalibela churches, which were carved out of volcanic basalt, vary in size and are decorated with Christian imagery, representing a rare and important example of early Christian architecture in Africa. Today, the rock-hewn structures remain a popular pilgrimage destination for the devout, and they are also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Lost City of Meroe Located in the East African country of Sudan, along the eastern bank of the Nile River, are the ruins of an ancient city called Meroe. Dating back to around 800 BC, the site constitutes one of Africa's most significant archaeological discoveries. The city was once a prominent trading post, embracing a sophisticated Egyptian culture and filled with palaces, pyramids, and iron production facilities, owing to its rich iron deposits and fertile soil. Meroe was a healthy metropolis of the ancient kingdom of Kush in what is now the Republic of Sudan. Kush was an ancient kingdom in Nubia, and they were major rivals to Egypt at one point. The many pyramids and works of art left behind are testament to the greatness of Nubian kings and queens. Despite how little known the ancient metropolis remains today, Meroe was well known to great societies of the time, including in Rome, Greece, and Persia. And some archaeologists theorize that the city also traded with early Indian and Chinese explorers. Meroe is even mentioned in the Book of Genesis under the name Ethiopia, which describes it as a prominent yet vulnerable center of commerce one which even raised and exported elephants for warfare. The problem is, for over seven centuries, the city was a prime target for invading forces. Over time, signs of Meroe's Egyptian influence faded, and its residents developed their own language, customs, and religion. Unfortunately, however, all those unique cultural facets were lost around 330 AD, when Meroe was permanently and completely destroyed. In 1821, archaeologists rediscovered the lost city, which had lain untouched since its destruction, and excavated around 200 of Meroe's unique Nubian pyramids. They also found evidence of the Meroitic written language, which went extinct around 400 AD and remains undeciphered to this day. National Geographic reports that one of the most remarkable features of the Meroitic civilization was its strong queens. One signed a peace treaty with Emperor Augustus from Rome, and the royal pyramids and burial chambers are full of remarkable treasures. 
Lady of Mali While some researchers claim this is nothing but a naturally formed chunk of rock, others believe that the Lady of Mali is a gigantic carving of a woman's face and figure. Some say that the Soninke of the Wagadu Empire could have carved the lady some 12,000 years ago. Also known as the White Lady of Africa, the formation is located on Mount Lora in northern Guinea, near the Senegal and Mali borders, where it sits at an altitude of over 10,000 feet. Nobody, including those who believe it is man-made, seems to know who supposedly carved it or when. Although estimates put the structure at an age somewhere between 5,000 and 25,000 years old. Reportedly discovered in 1997 by a quote-unquote geologist from Italy named Angelo Pitoni, with an obscure background and questionable credentials, he found it while looking for diamonds. The Lady of Mali is nicknamed the White Lady of Africa due to its, or her, Caucasian features, which are unusual for the area in which she's found. Pitoni somehow connected the formation with the lost civilization of Atlantis, which most mainstream scholars believe was fictional. Pitoni also claimed to find blue stones, or stones of the sky, synthetic stones that were left behind by some advanced ancient civilization. Experts also argue that the structure is not man-made at all, but a natural formation playing tricks on us because of its similarity to a woman's bust. What do you think? Is the Lady of Mali a carving left behind by an ancient civilization? Or is it a natural formation? Let me know in the comments below! Bakoni Ruins One of the world's biggest unsolved archaeological mysteries, known as the Bakoni Ruins, can be found in the hills near the South African town of Matadodorp, which is located in the country's Mpumalanga province. Made up of a collection of complex stone terraces, this reputed lost city dates back over 200,000 years, around the time when the first modern humans are thought to have evolved. The structures are accompanied by evidence of fields, roads, and settlements, and the site bears signs of technological and agricultural technology. Stone walls at the site suggest that the Bakoni tribe retained pasture animals, such as sheep and cattle. As if the existence of such early, sophisticated innovation wasn't fascinating enough, this site's most prominent feature is Adam's Calendar, a 98-foot stone circle containing monoliths within its walls, which are aligned to match the movement of the Orion's Belt constellation. All signs point toward Adam's Calendar being one of the earliest known, if not the oldest, monuments, indicating that ancient peoples charted and kept track of time. The complexity and uniqueness of the ruins, which are interconnected over several hundred kilometers via vast mazes and passages, are especially evident from a bird's eye view. It must have taken quite some time to build these structures, and their proven age suggests to archaeologists that the Bakoni tribe may have been around much longer than the constructions themselves. Pseudo-archaeologists and pseudo-scientists have latched onto conspiracy theories revolving around the site, of course they have, claiming that an ancient alien civilization may have built the Bakoni ruins. But the experts, and arguably any rational thinker, wouldn't think twice about crediting our early relatives for their intellect and hard work. Why not believe in the intelligence of our ancient ancestors? Oldest Tsunami Victims This also comes from Tanzania, more specifically along the banks of the Pangani River. It was there, a few miles inland from the Indian Ocean, that a Swahili village once thrived around 1,000 years ago, until one day, an earthquake-triggered tsunami swept through, wiping everything in its path out of existence. The entire village, including its wooden lattice houses, fishing nets, and Shelby jewelry was no longer. With no time to escape the barreling flood, the villagers themselves also tragically perished. A study published in May of this year asserts that the site contains the oldest known human remains within a tsunami deposit ever found in East Africa. While that is remarkable, the oldest tsunami deposit in the world that was ever found to contain human remains dates back 7,000 years and was discovered in Papua New Guinea, which is located across the Indian Ocean just north of Australia. This more recent discovery adds valuable information to researchers' quest to better understand Indian Ocean tsunamis and their history. Although tsunamis in the region are relatively infrequent, roughly once every 300 to 1,000 years, according to National Geographic, it's imperative for experts to learn more about them, as Tanzania's coastal city of Dar es Salaam is rapidly growing, with a projected population of at least 10 million by the year 2030. Protecting this burgeoning population and preventing a repeat of the fate suffered by the Swahili villagers 1,000 years ago is of utmost importance. Believe it or not, the tsunami that eradicated the village was not major, but it still had catastrophic results because the residents lived on low land. Ancient Pandemics 
The ongoing global coronavirus pandemic has drawn widespread attention to how modern science and medicine manage disease. It has also sparked a popular fascination with how past pandemics started and how past societies and governments handled rapidly spreading illnesses. As current events show, viruses are scary, and they have the power to dramatically and perhaps permanently alter human civilization. An article published in The Conversation in May of this year discusses some of these changes throughout ancient Africa, which are evidenced through archaeological discoveries. Written by Shadrach Chirikure, a professor of archaeology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, the article first mentions that during the early 14th century AD, settlements in the farming town of Akro Kroa in the West African country of Ghana experienced a mass abandonment, suggesting that the inhabitants were fleeing illness, quite possibly the Black Death which was sweeping across Europe, Asia, and North Africa at the time. In another example Chirikori mentions, 76 infant burials were unearthed at the Mapungubwe World Heritage Site in South Africa's Limpopo Valley, indicating that a pandemic may have hit the area sometime after the 11th century. So, how did past societies address pandemics besides by abandoning their settlements? After all, as the spread of COVID-19 shows, you can't run from a rampant virus forever because chances are it will eventually probably follow. While relocating settlements was probably a top survival method of choice, communities also burned their villages as a believed disinfection strategy. They also resorted to a less drastic and still practiced method of avoiding the spread of disease, social distancing. It turns out that this common sense way of avoiding sickness dates back to our ancestors. Tried and true, social distancing proves that even in modern times, with the advent of vaccines and advanced medicine, mixing old strategies with new technologies is a surprisingly effective approach. Archaeological evidence in some places throughout Africa, including at Mwenezi in southern Zimbabwe, also indicates that people avoided touching or going near the dead, sometimes to the point where doing so was considered taboo. It's very likely that this belief stemmed from negative consequences associated with interacting with human remains, quite possibly the suffering of deadly illnesses. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Number 10. Bakoni, South Africa In South Africa, on the hills around Makadodorp to the southeast of the country are the remains of a series of structures built by the Bakoni people. The hilly countryside is covered with terraces made of stone walls and large complexes of ruins. Now known as the Bakoni Ruins, very little is known about the people who built them, and it's believed they could have been constructed anywhere between 25,000 and 250,000 years ago. Based on these dates, it could be where the mother of all Homo sapiens came from, and many archaeologists have gone there to try to discover the origin of humanity. This area is also where the mysterious ceramic Leidenberg heads were discovered. What is certain is that the Bakoni ruins were built a long time before the colonization of South Africa, and they are evidence of advanced engineering and farming techniques. The walls cover hundreds of miles and suggest the existence of an established community. The Bakoni people themselves are not referred to in any written documents and only feature in spoken records. They're thought to be various different groups of people from different areas who arrived and became known as the Bakoni, or the people of the north. These ruins are proof that there's far more to ancient human history in Africa that is waiting to be found, and that these civilizations were far more advanced than previously thought. Number 9. The African City of Stone, Zimbabwe The country of Zimbabwe actually took its name in 1980 from this archaeological site, the ancient city of Great Zimbabwe. This city of stone was the center of the region between the 10th and 15th centuries and covered an area of around 1,779 acres. Now, the structures that remain include a number of stone enclosures, some of which are as tall as 36 feet. No mortar was used in their construction, and it's because of these buildings that the city got its name Zimbabwe, which in the Shona language means houses of stone. It is believed to have been a royal palace and would have been a center for political power and a possible trading hub. What remains of the city is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it is so important to the country that it not only gave it its name, but also the imagery on its flag. The bird sitting on a pedestal is a representation of a stone artifact that can be found at Great Zimbabwe. Despite its significance, only 2% of the ancient city has been excavated, so there's still plenty more to be discovered. Number 8. Getty, Kenya First found in 1884, the Getty ruins in the Arabuko Sokoke Forest in Kilifi, Kenya are all the remains of an ancient town, one that continues to be a mystery to archaeologists. 
There are no written records of Getty, but the structures and artifacts that have been found there show evidence of a once thriving town that was both advanced and affluent before its demise at some point in the 17th century. It's thought to have first been inhabited in the late 1200s and is one of a number of Swahili Arab coastal settlements on the Indian Ocean. All structures were made of stone and plaster, and the remains of several mosques houses, and a palace can still be seen. The Getty Ruins are a popular tourist destination in the region, but despite the interest in the place, it's still unclear why it was abandoned. Some argue that it was deserted because of an invasion, but there's no sign of a battle having taken place, while others believe it was as a result of the receding waters of the Indian Ocean, which caused all of the wells to dry up. Number 7. The Lalibela Churches, Ethiopia in the center of Ethiopia, about 400 miles from the capital city Addis Ababa, there is a mountainous region that was once a site of religious significance. Here, 11 monolithic churches were carved into the rock, thought to have been built by King Lalibela in an attempt to build a new Jerusalem in the 12th century, after Muslim conquest prevented Christians from being able to travel to their holy city. One of the churches, Biete Metane Alem, is thought to be the biggest monolithic church in the world, and it has five aisles. Nine of the structures were used as places of worship from the outset, while two of them were initially built as palaces before being converted. While the buildings have been a focus of pilgrimage for Coptic Christians since their construction, and still are today, some areas were filled in and covered up before being uncovered more recently, helping to understand more fully how significant this place was. It's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and should therefore be protected for generations to come. Number 6. The Stone Circles of Senegambia The Stone Circles of Senegambia are a series of megalithic structures that cover an area 62 miles wide along a 200-mile stretch of the River Gambia. It's not certain when the monuments were built, with estimates ranging between 2,300 and 400 years ago. Along with the stonework, pottery, graves, and pieces of metal have also been found, showing signs of a fairly advanced society. The series of structures are often split into four different groups, and between them there are more than 29,000 stones and 17,000 monuments over 2,000 different sites. Most of them were originally upright blocks or pillars, but many have now collapsed or fallen out of place. In a lot of ways, these stone circles are similar to the monoliths at Stonehenge and other sites around the world. They clearly had significance to those who constructed them, and a huge amount of time and resources were devoted to building them. These reasons have, though, been long forgotten, and without any written records from the time, we can only guess as to what they were for. Number 5. A Lost Tswana City, South Africa The Difakane civil wars in the 1820s led to the collapse of the majority of Tswana city-states that once stood strong along the northern parts of South Africa. Many of them were never even documented before being abandoned and are only now being rediscovered. One such city in the Suiker Bozrand Hills, about 37 miles south of Johannesburg, had been initially excavated by archaeologists 40 years ago, but recently, the use of LIDAR has shown the city once covered a much larger area than previously thought. It's believed that the people who built the stone structures in the region, known as Quenang, lived there between the 15th and 18th centuries. The site covers an area that's 6 miles long and 1 mile wide, and includes as many as 850 different homes. From what's known about Swana settlements, it's not clear how many people would have lived here, because each home would have been where large families lived, often the male head of the family along with one or more wives and their children. The homes were surrounded by structures that indicate each one's wealth, such as passages used to herd cattle and mounds made from the ash from cattle dung fires, used to show how large a herd of cattle was owned by the residents. Much more is yet to be uncovered here, and there's still lots to learn about the communities that lived in the Tswana cities, some of the last original inhabitants of South Africa before European countries seized control. Number 4. The Leti Jaw, Ethiopia As the continent where the human species developed, there are still a lot of questions about our ancestral lineage, some that have been answered recently by the discovery of the Leti Jaw. There's a big gap in our knowledge about how our own Homo genus evolved. What is known is that around 3 million years ago in East Africa, there were 4-foot-tall ape-like creatures known as Australopithecus. You may have heard of the fossils of Lucy, and she was one of them. At some point over the next 500,000 years, the Australopithecus completely disappeared, and about 2 million years ago, the first Homo appeared. It's long been thought that Homo evolved from Australopithecus, but no remains had been found to prove this theory. 
This is why the discovery of the Leddy jaw was so important. It's a fossil of an early member of the Homo genus and dates back to about 2.8 million years, right at the time that researchers are interested in. It's also believed to be a transitional jaw. It has traits of both Australopithecus, such as the lack of a defined chin, and Homo with the symmetrical molars and evenly proportioned jaw. It was found in the Afar region of Ethiopia, very close to where Lucy and other remains have been found. So it's quite possible that this is the missing link that archaeologists have been looking for, and it fills in the gaps of how our own genus developed. Number three. Meroe Sudan Egypt is, of course, well known for its pyramids, but it's not the only country in Africa where they were built. In the desert to the east of Sudan, along the River Nile, there is a series of almost 200 ancient pyramids, with most of them serving as tombs for the leaders of the Meroitic Kingdom. They were built between 2700 and 2300 years ago and incorporate decorative styles from Egypt, Greece, and Rome. They are Nubian pyramids with narrow bases and steep angles on their sides and are much smaller than the most famous ones found in Egypt. Along with them, there are other structures such as ornamental stone rams, chapels, and temples, and they are often clustered around areas with as many as 20 built together. Just like in Egypt, it's quite possible that there are still plenty more of these structures and treasures hidden beneath the sand and plenty more to learn about this long-lost civilization. Number 2. Las Gil, Somalia Las Gil, which means source of water for camels, is a series of rock shelters and caves that lie about 34 miles northeast of the capital city of Somaliland, Hargeza. This site is now dry, but it's near the confluence of two former rivers, which would explain why it was once known as a water source and a place with extensive evidence of human activity. The combination of the political tensions in the area and that locals have long believed the region to be haunted by evil spirits means that despite knowing about its existence, few people ventured into the caves in the past centuries. Recent archaeological expeditions have braved the curse, though, and found a series of incredible paintings on the cave walls. It's thought that there are as many as 350 animal and human representations, as well as countless tribal marks etched into the stone. Most have been preserved incredibly well because they have been sheltered from the elements, and they give unique insight into life at the time. The most commonly depicted animal is a cow, but there are also dogs, monkeys, antelope, giraffes, and hyenas. As with all cave paintings, it's very difficult to determine when they were created, but estimates based on the pigments suggest they are between 4,500 and 5,500 years old, with some experts suggesting that they could have been painted as much as 11,000 years ago. Number 1. Olduvai Gorge, Tanzania In northern Tanzania, the Olduvai Gorge is where some of the most important discoveries have been made about our ancient ancestors. Archaeologists and paleoanthropologists have worked in the area for more than a century and have found stone tools and bones dating back millions of years. This means that we humans evolved in Africa. This place is where Lewis and Mary Leakey found one of the first fossil ape skulls as well as extinct creatures and the Aldoan, which is considered to be the earliest human technology. The Aldoan is the oldest known stone tool and evidence of cultural behavior in Homo habilis. It's also the place where some of the first types of Aculean tools were found, sharpened pieces of rock and flint that would have been instrumental for life at the time and developed from the original Aldoan ones. The artifacts found in this region date back almost 2 million years and have been invaluable in understanding early human life and how the primitive species went on to develop into what we are today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Number 10. Sibudu and Blombos, South Africa Sibudu and Blombos are two of the most famous archaeological sites in South Africa and have both led to a new understanding of the way different Stone Age groups lived. Despite being more than 600 miles apart, artifacts found in caves at both of these sites are strikingly similar, but still have noticeable differences. Researchers at Sibudu Cave in northern KwaZulu-Natal have found the earliest known bone arrow and the earliest needle from 61,000 years ago. They also found the earliest known evidence of the use of bedding from 77,000 years ago. In Blombo's Cave, about 180 miles to the east of Cape Town, archaeologists have uncovered engraved bones, beads, stone and bone tools, and a 100,000-year-old ochre processing workshop, 
where an ochre-based mixture was created for use in decoration and skin protection. The surprising thing about the finds in each cave is that the people who lived there around 71,000 years ago were using similar types of stone tools, but had differences in the way they were making them. This was partly to do with the different types of stone available, but in Sibudu, stone napping was focused on creating thin, long, double-pointed stone points which would have been used as cutting devices and on the tips of weapons. The Blombos objects were fashioned in a markedly different way, but still to achieve the same result. These finds show that stone working techniques developed separately at that time, but something happened within 6,000 years. All tools found from 65,000 years ago have similarities in structure, which suggests that cultural traditions had spread across the region we now know as South Africa. It's because of finds like this that researchers can chart the societal development of early humans and show how communication and teaching allowed different groups to learn. This was, in effect, the first known example of humans working with and helping one another. Number 9. Laetoli, Tanzania Laetoli in Tanzania is incredibly important in the understanding of early humans, as it's the site of the discovery of five sets of footprints that date back to 3.66 million years ago. Originally, three sets were found in 1976, preserved in the rock after a group of Australopiths walked across damp volcanic ash as it was hardening. These were the same species of our ancestors as the famous Lucy, and remain by far the oldest footprints of hominids that have ever been found. What was interesting was that they were made by upright walkers, ones that walked in a similar way to how we do, with a well-developed arch in the foot and using the big toe to push off from the ground. Recently, two more sets of footprints have been found, and this has given further insight into the social dynamics of Australopiths. The new theory based on these finds is that they behaved similar to gorillas, with a single dominant male being accompanied by a group of females and their offspring. Number 8. The Great Mosque of Genet, Mali The town of Genet was founded in 800 AD on an island in the Niger River Delta in present-day Mali. It was one of sub-Saharan Africa's oldest cities and became a trade hub for people to transport gold, salt, and slaves. All of the structures here were made from mud, but the biggest building on the site was the Great Mosque. The original mosque was built in the 13th century, but over time it fell into disrepair and became inhabited by huge swarms of swallows who built their nests inside of it. When the town was conquered during the Tugulor War in the 19th century, the mosque was closed and a new one was built nearby by Seku Amadu. In 1893, the town was recaptured by French forces, who demolished the new mosque, built a school on the site, and began work to rebuild the original Great Mosque. Completed in 1907, the new building was made with the same techniques, using sun-baked mud bricks, bundles of palm branches, and a mud plaster coating on the walls. An annual festival is held where locals work together to repair the mosque to ensure that it lasts. Built on a place steeped in such history, countless artifacts have been found here from across the ages, and it's no surprise this is one of the most famous landmarks in Africa and designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Number 7. Sterkfontein Caves, South Africa The Sterkfontein Caves in South Africa's Cradle of Humankind have provided the richest source of hominid fossils in the world. It's also the site of the longest paleoanthropological dig ever, with continuous excavations taking place since 1935, only pausing during the Second World War. The limestone caves, about 25 miles northwest of Johannesburg, were where the first adult Australopithecine to be discovered was found, along with the remains of Paranthropus and early Homo species. In total, more than 500 different hominids have been unearthed here, some dating back as far as 2.6 million years. The discoveries made in these caves have been instrumental in the understanding of the evolution and behaviors of early human species, without which we'd have nowhere near as much information about our early ancestors and how we became what we are today. Excavations at Sterkfontein continue with researchers believing there's plenty more to be found. Who knows what they'll unearth next? And now for number six, but first, be sure to subscribe before you leave. There's more where this came from. Number six. The Obelisk of Aksum, Ethiopia Between the 4th century BC and 10th century AD, the Kingdom of Aksum was one of the most influential civilizations on Earth. The capital, the city of Aksum, was a trade city between Persia and Rome and was extremely powerful and wealthy. As a pagan civilization, the people constructed tall pillars to mark the tombs of the most revered leaders, but in the 4th century they converted to Christianity and the pagan practices were ended. 
The 80-foot obelisk of Aksum was allowed to remain in place, though, but in the 16th century, it's believed the structure was toppled by an earthquake. As the population no longer cared for its significance, the pieces soon were buried beneath the sand. In 1935, the pieces were rediscovered by Italian soldiers during their conquest of Ethiopia, and they transported the three pieces, weighing a total of 160 tons, back to Rome, where it was reassembled. Following the Second World War, the UN ruled that the Italians must return it to Ethiopia, but after significant delays, this only happened in 2007. The pieces were then reassembled, and the complete obelisk was installed near two other famous pillars, the Great Steel, which is 108 feet tall, and the King Izana Steel, one of the last to have ever been built. Together, these three stand as a monument to a once mighty civilization, and make you wonder what else may still be hidden beneath the sands. Number 5. Leptis Magna Libya Believed to have been founded as early as the 7th century BC, Leptis Magna, which lies 62 miles to the southeast of Tripoli in Libya, is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. While you may only think of the Romans conquering large swaths of Europe, this place on the northern coast of Africa is home to some of the world's best-known remains of Roman architecture and was an important outpost for them. It was officially designated as a community with full rights of citizenship by the Roman Emperor Trajan, who reigned between the year 98 and 117, and the Emperor Septimius Severus, who ruled the empire a century later, who was born there. During this time, a massive building program began, which saw the harbor being artificially enlarged and countless other structures being built. The fall of the Roman Empire led to difficulties, though, and after the Arab conquest of 642, Leptis fell into ruin. It was only in the early 20th century that the city was excavated from the sands, which have seen the discovery of extensive baths, a grand basilica, and an intricate forum. Leptis Magna is an immensely important historical site and shows the extent to which the Roman Empire spread. Number 4. The Nok Civilization, Nigeria The Nok Civilization is thought to have been the first complex civilization in West Africa, but it was only because of a chance discovery that their existence came to light. Tin miners in the Kaduna state of central Nigeria were digging when they found a large collection of terracotta artifacts, unlike anything anyone had seen before. Since then, archaeologists have found stone tools, rock paintings, and iron objects, including bracelets and deadly spear points and knives. We have since learned that the Nok civilization first emerged around 900 BC and mysteriously disappeared 1,100 years later. They were a very advanced society and had one of the most complex judicial systems in the world at the time. The most standout objects that have been found are undoubtedly the life-size terracotta statues. At least 2,500 years old, they are mainly of people with large elongated heads with hollow eyes and parted lips. It's not clear what they were for, whether ornamental, as a representation of the gods or of worship, or maybe to represent important members of the society. There's still a lot to learn about the Nok, and we still don't know why the once thriving culture seems to have suddenly collapsed. There are surely more clues still waiting to be found, and it's only a matter of time until we get more answers. Number 3. Kilwa Kisiwani, Tanzania Just off the coast of Tanzania is the island of Kilwa Kisiwani, which means the Isle of Fish a place that was once home to a wealthy port that was the center of one of the most powerful empires of Eastern Africa. It was an influential place from between the 9th century until the 19th century, providing a vital link to the Swahili civilization that stretched from Kenya to Mozambique. Today, though, the once magnificent structures built here are equally stunning ruins. Of particular note is the site of the Great Mosque, the oldest one on the East African coast, which has 16 domes that are supported by arches and pillars. There's also the site of the palace of Husuni Kubwa, which looks over the island from one of its highest points and was for a long time the largest structure in sub-Saharan Africa. Kilwa Kisiwani was well positioned to be successful and was on the trading routes between Africa, China, India, and Arabia. Valuable treasures such as porcelain, ivory, quartz, spices, and tortoiseshells passed through here, and it was only when the Portuguese built a fort on the island in the 16th century that its trading dominance in the region began to wane. Number 2. Abomey Benin Once the capital city of the Kingdom of Dahomey of the Fawn, Abomey is now a much quieter place, but the evidence of its historical significance is still clear to see. The royal palaces are a UNESCO World Heritage Site and are now a museum to the ancient kingdom, where you can see the remains of kings and lots of other artifacts that have been found. The city was built in 1625 and thrived as a trade outpost. 
The kings led violent wars, carried out human sacrifices, and were some of the most prolific slave traders in Western Africa. Despite their extreme mistreatment of people from outside their kingdom, they took care of their own, ensuring that Abomey was a beautiful place, with a tall perimeter wall, a very deep moat, and numerous markets, squares, and temples. They built 12 royal palaces, but only two remain after the last king, Behanzin, was defeated by the French and set fire to the city as he fled. Number 1. Adam's Calendar, South Africa Located in Mpumalanga, South Africa, Blaufbosch Kral, more commonly known as Adam's Calendar, just easier to say, is an ancient megalithic site. The standing stone circle is about 100 feet in diameter and is actually one of many stone circle ruins that have been found throughout the mountains of South Africa. It's thought that there could be as many as 100,000 such ruins, but Adam's Calendar is the standout one. It first came to attention in 2003, when a pilot, while rescuing one of his crew who had crashed, walked over a ledge and saw the circle. He was used to seeing structures like it from high up, but this was the first time he'd seen one so close. He realized that the stones were aligned to the compass points, as well as the equinoxes and solstices, and after months of surveying, he became certain that it was a calendar, and it still works perfectly as of today. The thing that's most amazing about this site is that it's believed to be at least 75,000 years old, with some estimates even suggesting it's up to 160,000 years old. This predates Stonehenge and the Egyptian pyramids by many tens of thousands of years, and makes it by far the oldest megalithic site to have ever been found. Thanks for watching! Just in case you missed it, be sure to check out part 1 of Amazing Archaeological Discoveries for more! Be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time! Bye!